In this video, we're gonna be covering Rock Desktop. Let's get into it. So what is Rock Desktop? Rock Desktop is our desktop software used for pre-processing and generating a colorized and calibrated point cloud file. It has a load of calibration tools inside of it and a lot of fine tuning tools so you can specifically get the best data out of your system every time that you fly. Now, what actually it does is it takes the raw data from your Rock R3 Pro, but it also works with the Rock R2A and Rock R360. And it takes that raw data from the IMU, the laser scanner and the camera and the GNSS and the data from your base station and combines those and to get a highly accurate trajectory. And then it projects that out into a 3D point cloud. Now, Rock Desktop can work in the field. So you can actually take your laptop with you into the field and take your data sets while you're at, right after you fly and generate a point cloud right there to verify and validate that you've captured everything. It's really handy. Now, Rock Desktop also allows you to just take that file right there as soon as you get done generating it and do anything you want with it. Or you can use the handy dandy upload tool and sync it right to the Rock Cloud and it does a 10 times faster upload than if you were just to take an LES file and drag and drop it to the Rock Cloud. So it's also a nice little portal to get faster upload speeds to the Rock Cloud and you can use this for any LES in the future. But when you generate an LES right through Rock Desktop, it makes it super fast to sync that data to the Rock Cloud and create a project. Okay, so now before we get into a workflow, I'm gonna cover that. We're gonna step step by step into processing your data. Let's do a little housekeeping. So if you're just now getting an R3 Pro, there's a few things you're gonna do before you jump to the step we're gonna to go to today. Step one, you're gonna to wanna to activate your license for Rock Desktop in the pre-processing software, Rock Desktop. And to do this, you should receive an email and this is gonna give you a coupon to register your Rock Cloud business account and then also your Rock Desktop license. Once you've done that on the Rock Cloud through that email, you will then register the serial number, which is right here on the QR code at the bottom of your R3 Pro. Register that serial number on the Rock Cloud. It's really easy, just go to your profile and you'll be able to add that serial number in there. And then finally, you will download Rock Desktop and then activate it by logging in to your account by going to the file in the top left-hand side and going to preferences and user and log in and you'll activate the license. I'm not gonna show you, I have a bunch of licenses and I don't wanna give them all away. So I'm not gonna show you that there. I should uh, blur those out, but you should see an icon that says activate. And once it's activated, you can click on return. So that is a little bit of a uh, housekeeping before we get into how to process data set. And then we can talk about a little bit about computer specs. So what you really wanna have is a core i7 or better, 32 gigabytes of RAM or more. And then you also want an NVIDIA GeForce GTX 1050 or higher GPU. So you want a good NVIDIA GPU in there. And then it's highly recommended to have an NVMe, NVMe drive. So that's like the better uh, hard drive inside your computer. They're just a little faster because what you're always gonna do is copy your data to your local machine before processing. And with that said, let's jump right into processing our first data set. So the first thing we're gonna do is, before even opening up Rock Desktop, we're going to take the USB drive from our R3 Pro, pop it into our computer, and we're going to copy over our data to the computer, to the local drive. And then we're also going to take our raw base station data, our observation, this is a Rhinex data format, copy that over to the same folder. After you've copied both those data sets to the local machine, go ahead and open up Rock Desktop. Now we can see here, I'm on the home screen Rock Desktop, it says, welcome to Rock Desktop. And at this point, I can actually see the version, I'm on version 1.8 currently. Hopefully it's newer by the time you're, you're watching this. We update it pretty frequently. And a quick note about updating your Rock Desktop, it automatically does it. So if you sit here and wait for a little bit, a pop-up might show up that says, hey, there's a new new update available. And all you have to do is close and it'll be, it'll be loaded automatically. And that's how you update. So just go ahead and close the software and reopen it and it'll be new again. It'll be the latest version. That's all you do to update. It's always gonna keep you kind of updated. Um, here on the home screen, let's go ahead and click process rock data. So you can see I had a license activated. It quickly showed that. 
And the first step I'm gonna do is select my processing folder. So we can see here I have a folder and I actually have three flights I did on this day on the R3 Pro. And we're gonna process this third flight. So actually all I'm gonna do is select this folder and click select folder. It's gonna go ahead and scan through there. And now here's some information about the sensor. It's the Rock R3 Pro. That's my serial number, so please blur that one out. Um, and my firmware version, and this is, should be blurred out as well because this is a beta version that is not released to the public. Uh, and now we have select sensor profile. So let's stop here for a second. Select sensor profile is actually an important concept for us to start understanding right now because we have a system profile and a factory default profile. And there's actually a couple other options. I'll talk about those in a second. What we're talking about is we got this camera on here. So we got a camera and it's detachable. So one of the things that happens when you take it off and put it back on, because if you're gonna do slam, you take that camera off and then you put it back on, it has ever so small movements on this camera. So when we calibrate the camera, the RGB to the LiDAR data, that calibration is good as long as you don't take the camera off, put it back on. Now that being said, I'm gonna show you how to do it. We have a few awesome tools coming out that will make this automatic in the future. But as of today, we still have to do some clicky clicky and it will be totally aligned. So it's not that big of a deal, but just so you know, currently if you take the camera off and put it back on, the RGB calibration will go out of calibration and you're gonna to have to click some key points matching in order to calibrate it back to the lighter data. So that's just something you need to know. And whenever you do that, you're gonna save a new profile. So we got the factory default profile. That's the one that came with it out of the box. And it still needs to be calibrated if you take the camera off. So that'll be the factory default. And then we got the system profile. And this is if you go through the calibration process and then save it to a system. So this is like a little, little memory drive over here. I'm gonna store my current one as the system, but I can always go back to factory default. And then after you process data, it's gonna store the project calibration. So if you ever come back in time to a previous data set, you're gonna have those calibrations saved for that project. Okay, I know that was a lot, but you gotta bear with us here as we release a few more features to make this super simple. And so that's kind of the most complicated part is understanding what those mean. So for this one, I'm gonna use a system profile because that one's um, pretty good for me right now. And then the next step here is I'm gonna select the base station. So it's gonna automatically open me up inside the folder. Uh, I'm gonna go up one directory because I have the reach base right here. And I'm going to select this 23.0. This is the observation file. So I select that, go and open, uh, use default base station location. I can actually uncheck that and I can enter in the precise location of the base station in uh, WS84 ellipsoidal height. So if you know the location of your base station, whether you surveyed it in or you've been provided with a location that you put your base station up on top, you can enter that in here and it has to be in WGS84, ellipsoidal height. If not, it will use the average position from your Rhinex file. Uh, so I'm gonna do that today. I'm just gonna leave it into that. Uh, agree to terms and conditions, sound great. And I'm going to click next. So really all I did here, let's just go over that really fast while it's processing the trajectory is I just selected the folder, selected my base station file, I left it on the system default, and I clicked next. That's all I did. Uh, pretty simple. So when you're in the field, you can just do that, and now it's gonna go ahead and go through the data and calculate that precise trajectory. And then we're gonna see another process window where we're gonna be able to select flight lines and select a bunch of other uh, variables to fine tune our data sets. Let's let it process. Okay, now I just finished processing the trajectory and generating this point cloud. And now the next screen that we're seeing here is that we have all of these trajectories pre-sliced uh, by Rock Desktop. So we went ahead and found that this was a you know, straight line. Now, as, as you can see here, it's not perfect every time. So we actually have this green one right here and then a space and then this uh, red one down here. Now, what we wanna do is select the data that we want to produce into the final point cloud. So that's what we're doing here. We're selecting in the trajectory what data we want. And so what we want is we wanna have each flight line of data. So I'm gonna go ahead and delete this green one. Boom. And then we want to actually extend 
Not that one. Is it this one? There we go. We're going to extend that one. That's the data that we want. And then we also want to delete this side one. And there we go. So that is all the data that we, and if we actually just bring it right back here. So that's one, two, three. I feel like we're, there we go. So those are the three sections we want. Now you always want to cut off your uh, convergence maneuver, your calibration, and you just want to get the mission plan that you got. So this is important. If you're uh, generating point cloud data from when you take off and then you fly that high speed and your figure eights, you don't want any of that and you don't want your landing stuff. So what you want to do is just cut it to the flight lines that you have. You can always add another flight line in between. So if I wanted a little bit more data right here, you can see I just click that plus sign and there it is on the top. So you can add some more in there. You can remove them, do whatever you'd like to get exactly the data that you want. But the best advice I can give you right now is just select the flight lines of the data that you want to produce. Get rid of all the corners and just get that the creme de la creme, the nice stuff. Okay, so once you've uh, configured that and you said that's what I want, now I want to come up here to the next couple things in this screen. So I'm going to rotate the screen a little bit so we can see. So we have angle gate here. And if I click this eyedropper, it's going to colorize the data by the angle of the lighter data where it came. So here we have the R3. So straight down is zero. And this is basically showing your field of view. So sometimes you might want to actually open up that field of view a little bit wider. Maybe you have some tall objects like power lines or you have a vertical structure. And I want to get that data because, you know, it just didn't show up right away. But this is a full 360 degree scanner. So we can really play around with this angle to get all the information that we want. Now here's a word of caution. Now the reason we have this negative 30 to 30, 60 degree field of view as default is because statistically speaking, the best data comes from the closest you can get to going straight down. So if you shrink this field of view smaller, the better the data is gonna get. And the reason this is, is because if you think about a flashlight, so all this is, this is a laser scanner, right? So you have laser beams coming out of this and each one of those laser beams is like a flashlight. And the further you get away from a wall, the bigger that circle of the flashlight gets. Now, the other thing is, if you take a flashlight and go to a hallway, and start shining the flashlight straight on the edge of the wall, but then you point it along the hallway, the light's gonna stretch out and cover all the way down the hallway. So the same thing, if you're pointing straight down, it's gonna hit flat circle right onto the ground. But if you start pointing way off to the side, that circle is gonna get really long and that's where the inaccuracies come from. So it's that spot size will increase. So you can really fine tune this to get just that perfect creme de la creme, I'm calling it now, uh, data that you want to get from your LiDAR scanner. The other thing that affects this, so you can see here, I'll play with this. I can make it wider. I can make it very narrow. And it's really easy to see the overlap as well. So if I make it really narrow, you can see there's no overlap. And right about here at 14 degrees and 14 degrees, I just start getting the overlap. Now, for this case, it's very flat, so you know what? I'm actually gonna push this to just 20 degrees, because why not? So now I'm only dealing with a 40 degree field of view total. And you can see right here, there's not overlap there, because you can do that. It's really easy in the Rock desktop, so you might as well get the best data you possibly can. Now let's talk about the next thing above it. We have the range gate. So we can click on the eyedropper of that one as well. And now everything is colorized by the distance from the trajectory where that data point came from. So what we can do is sometimes when you're flying really high, uh, or maybe you weren't flying high, but then the ground just undulated out from underneath you. You flew over a volley or something happened and it looks like there's no data there. I can show you if I, if I reduce this. Oh, there's no data. You see that? So maybe your data set looks like this, but you can grab this and you can extend it until you see all the data captured. So we also put a little recommendation that, you know, beyond a certain point, although yes, you're still getting data, it's not the most accurate data. So it's just like photogrammetry, 
where the further away from the ground you get, the bigger the pixels and less accurate your map can be made. Same thing with LiDAR. The further away you get, the less accurate the data becomes. So we recommend around 60 meters AGL. And we started off on that range field of view at 30 to 30, so 60 degrees, so 60 and 60. Um, but you can always go further if you want, and you can always go shorter as well. So here's a couple other things I wanna talk about. If you are opening that field of view really wide because you missed some information, maybe you were next to a power line and that tower, you flew too close to it and you need to open up that side angle to get that tower as you flew by it, you can actually use the range gate along with the angle gate together. So I can open it up really wide, but now I don't wanna get these points that go way over here and do that same, that hallway thing I talked about. Well, I could put a range gate on it. So any of the data that would go that far, well, it's gonna cut off anyways. So these are the mindsets and these are things that you wanna think about when you're playing around with this to get the optimal best data set from the R3 Pro or from your R360 or from your R2A. Um, so we do this, it's, you do it on all of them. And having the functionality to see it in real time to do it on a Rock Desktop really allows you to have that control to get the best data set possible for your system. Okay, so now that being said, let's go ahead and go back to the default of 65 on this one, I guess. I said 60, but it's set at 65, that's okay. Anyway, 64 is fine. Uh, set, likewise, the minimum, you can change the minimum as well. Maybe you had some birds flying underneath you. You can cut them out pretty easily. Uh, so there we go. Now we have a distance from sensor, range gate, as well as the angle gate, as well as our trajectory selected. Everything looks good to me. Go ahead and click next. Now we're on the process point cloud menu and here we can change the project name, the LAZ name, and this optimization level. So in Rock Desktop with the R3, we've actually made some awesome advancements to how we calibrate your data when it's, in, when it's producing it. And we're using some augmentation from SLAM in order to optimize aerial data. And so that's what this optimization level is. And you'll have to play with it to find the best uh, one for your case. Uh, sometimes it is none but oftentimes I'm doing medium. So medium is pretty common for me to use, and that's where I'm getting some of the best results from in accuracy from the R3 Pro. Um, so today I'm gonna leave it at medium, and then I have colorized point clouds selected. And the next thing you do is you can just click start processing, and that will generate your colorized calibrated point cloud. Really is that easy. But we have a couple other options inside of here. Uh, we have this drop down that says calibrate camera and calibrate LiDAR and process. So now I'm actually gonna go ahead and dive deep into the camera calibration with you and explaining how to calibrate the camera. If you wanna stop right here and just click start processing, that's good for you. If you're out in the field, this is what I would do. I would just quickly select my, my trajectories. Actually, I probably wouldn't even go that far. I would just go to the last screen and just verify it's all there and that's all, I'm done. I can stop, I can keep flying. I've checked the data set. You don't need to actually produce the whole point cloud at this point, who cares? All right, let's go ahead and take a second and talk about calibrating a camera. So I'm gonna go ahead and click the drop down and click calibrate camera and process. Okay, so when calibrating the camera, here I have the R3 with the 26 megapixel camera right here. There's a few things we wanna do. First, we're gonna select photos in order to calibrate. So I'm gonna select three photos today and look at these photos I'm gonna select. And let's take a look at why I'm selecting them. So I'm gonna select this photo right here and let's open that one so you can see it. So it's a parking lot and it has lines going all the way top to bottom and left to right. Now, honestly, here on the left side, there's not a lot of features here on the far left of the photo. What you really wanna have is you wanna have good features like a parking lot like this one on the bottom left, the bottom right, the top right, the top left, and the center, and actually really just everywhere. But you gotta think about it. Really what you're doing, we're gonna select points that match, and you're just stretching the photo over that point cloud. And so that's the way to think about it. Like if you were to take the photo, and I wanna make it perfect onto this, you know, intensity view of the liner data, I want it to fit the liner data. Well, I wanna stretch it over here, stretch it over here, stretch, and I wanna pin, you know, these points in the photo in order to calibrate it perfectly. So that's, that's the mindset. And if you don't have all of the features that you want in one photo, that's okay. So you can select many photos to make together 
all the features you want in all the quadrants of the photos. So let's just say, for example, on this one, I didn't have all the features on that left-hand side. Now I wanna find another photo that's a little bit more strong on the left-hand side. So let's go ahead and look down here and, well, this photo looks pretty good. So you can see there's the lane markings there, really strong on that left-hand side. And so, honestly, I think this looks pretty good. So I'm gonna go ahead and click start processing. If you need more photos, you need more photos. I just need two today. That looks fine to me because it covers with features all of the, the location. So click start processing. It's gonna generate some uh, LiDAR data sets for us to go ahead and start tagging points in. While it's doing that, let me tell you about how I flew to do a calibration with the camera. So the most ideal flight I found is about 40 to 50 meters in the air, and I fly about two meters per second. Real slow, decently low. And this is gonna give me enough dense point cloud data in order to find those points to click and attach them to the correct photo and to do the calibration. So that's, that's kind of where I've found this sweet spot. So let's go ahead and let it keep going. And then we'll start selecting some points. All right, so now we see the RGB view of the LiDAR data. We can actually go ahead and click on intensity. I can adjust this intensity in order to see these lane markings really well. They really pop out. And this is just like one photo's worth of data here. So I'm gonna RGB, intensity. And you can see that the RGB and intensity are pretty darn close. I mean, let's see. I mean, honestly, I think it's already aligned pretty well today. And I, I took it off and put it back on to try making this video for you guys. Um, but we'll go through the motion so you can see what I'm doing here. So here on the right-hand side, you can see add camera point. If I click that, it's in the RGB view. You can see the lane marking. I'm gonna find the corner of this lane marking right there. And then I'm gonna add a LiDAR point. Okay, maybe it moved one pixel. Maybe, hard to tell. So I'm gonna select that one. And now I'm gonna do it again in the same kind of area. Oh, sorry. I'm click plus, add camera point. Let's do this next one on this corner. And I'm gonna add the LiDAR point. Gosh, it's pretty much spot on, isn't it? I'm gonna overlap them on that one. Okay, let's go ahead and come over here to the bottom. I'm gonna adjust the intensity a little bit so I can see us a little bit better. Let's go ahead and add another one, add a camera point. Okay, this is, you can see a little movement here. Add a LiDAR point. All right. Let's do this bottom one. Yeah, a little, little movement, so I did need to calibrate it. What you want to do is just get as close as you can. There's not always a point there. And if you do notice there's like not a lot of points there, it's best to choose a few more, you know, key pair matches in that same region. So that way it averages out over that, you know. And again, guys, we're going to make this a lot easier. This is like step one. Step two is about to come out using computer vision to do a lot of these tasks. So, but at the end of the day, you're always going to have this tool to work with, which is really nice. Like I think having having a tool to always come in here and just make things perfect if you ever want to. If you ever want to, not, not a lot of people do though, then you can. You guys can just skip over this if you want to. If you, like A lot of people don't even care about the camera stuff. I do. I care a lot. All right, there you go. Now you can see I've selected the uh, 15 points here and I got the top left, the bottom left, bottom right, top right, and some in the center. And I got some here in kind of the, the north, south, and the west, or east, sorry. Uh, but then yeah, maybe I can add one over here. We'll, do, we'll just do one more just for, for posterity's sake. Add the camera point, add the lighter point. And there we go. So it's pretty balanced uh, across the whole frame of the photo here. And now once I've got this done, now again, if it didn't have all this features and all the sections of one photo, 
you can just go to the next one, click next, and then add some more anywhere that's lacking. Because uh, at the end of the day, it's gonna combine all of these to one data set to find these final calibration parameters. But you can see here, this one satisfies all our conditions, so we're looking pretty good. So I'm gonna go ahead and click next. And now we have these three different modes uh, of calibration. We have extrinsics, intrinsics, and both. What does that mean? It's probably complicated to you. Let's talk about it really fast. Okay, so we got a camera. There's two different things. There's intrinsic properties, which just means in the camera. That means like the actual sensor, the lens, all the distortions associated with the camera. Now, if you're receiving a R3, after this video is published, we actually have already have a solve for this intrinsic. So you can calibrate it again if you'd like, but our factory calibrations are even better than they've ever been. Uh, so you might never need to do that again. Now the extrinsic is this problem I talked about a second ago, which is the actual fraction of a degree because how much you tighten this on there of this camera being just ever so slightly different. So the extrinsic is just the external orientation of the camera. So today, that's all I wanna calibrate, and that's what I'm gonna recommend you to calibrate only. So go ahead and click Start Calibration. Calibration complete, that was fast. And now we have a new calibration. So let's go ahead and produce a point cloud. We're gonna call this the training. It's gonna be the training LAZ. And let's click start processing. There we go, guys. So we covered how to calibrate your camera. We covered how to choose the folder, the base station, uh, what the different uh, profiles mean for the camera as well. And then we looked at, you know, kind of really in detail how to fine tune and get the best data out of your system possible. We talked about selecting your trajectory, the auto selection of the trajectory. And then we talked about the angle gate and the range gate. And so all these coming together, and hopefully you guys have learned you know, through this video and I've explained it well enough. Uh, when it all comes together, you're going to get this beautiful optimized point cloud. Even if you don't do a lot of it, it still is gonna be great, but you have the power and the authority to make things even better. And that's really what I wanna teach you guys here today is like with Rock Desktop, you really can just use it as a quick and dirty down the field and just verify things there and that that's fine. And you can also be a power user like I've shown you this really detailed approach uh, and make it even better and, and more optimized. So that and everything in between is possible. Um, and we have a bunch of new features coming out. So again, like I said, the camera calibration stuff, we're about to have some AI that's gonna auto calibrate a lot of these things for you every time, you know, because with great, uh, functionality of being able to go from the drone in order to go to slam to mobile comes, uh, you know, a few things that we need to solve and making AI to do it all is really important. So I'm going to go ahead and let this finish uh, converting. And once it's done, uh, we're going to show you that final colorized calibrated point cloud. And there we go. There is our final colorized point cloud. Looking beautiful. You see the trajectory, how I flew. Beautiful looking parking lines, park, parking lot here. Uh, and here on the bottom left it says save calibration for future use. I'm gonna go ahead and save that. And I can save it as the system profile or just save it to the project. In this case, I'm going to save it, I'm gonna save it as both because I'm gonna keep using this for quite a while. And once this is all done, I can go ahead and click this upload button and give it a name, training and description. Training. And I flew this at, I think 45 meters at two meters per second. Because this was slow for the camera calibration. You can always fly much faster for data collection, but I wanted to get a good one for the calibration. Go ahead, click save. And there we go, it's creating the project in the rock cloud. It's gonna upload the data. Should happen pretty quick. We got the trajectory uploaded already. And we're at 
25% already. All right, guys, now while that's finishing, I hope you guys have found this video very informative. And I'm going to see you on the next one where I'm training you more about how to fly or how to use other rock products. So see you on the next one.